everybody. Uh, Tracy Smythe, I'm a member of the Durham Master Gardeners, and just a little bit about us. We are a, a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing fact based horticultural knowledge uh, to members of Durham Region. Um, we're always looking for new members, and if anybody's interested in uh, joining us, uh, you don't have to be an expert gardener to join. It's a great way to learn. And uh, there will be some information at the uh, end of the presentation if you are interested in going to our website and learning more about us. So we're going to talk about composting tonight. And first of all, we're going to say, nope. why is this not, there we go. Okay. So we're going to cover a couple of things tonight, like what is composting and why we should do it, how we do it and uh, different types of composting because not everybody um, has access to certain types of composting so there's a great way there's all kinds of ways that you can you can do it no matter where it is you're living whether it's a house or a small apartment so we're going to go into a little bit of that so our first poll just to see who's doing what there i'm going to let supri um, start this can everyone see the poll please How are we doing? Has everybody answered and gotten involved? We just have two more, pe two more answers, so just, just a few seconds. We have a 50-50 <laughs> so far. <laughs> okay. Is everyone okay to end the poll? Has everyone had, had a chance to answer? Okay, they're saying thumbs up. Great. So, I'm not seeing on my screen the, uh, the results of the poll. Do you have them there? Oh, sorry. sorry. Can you see it now? Well, that's terrific. It's nice to know I've got a really engaged audience. Everybody <laughs> plans on composting or does already, so that's great news. So we'll move on here. Why is it doing this? There we are. Okay, so what is composting? First thing that we need to do is we need to understand why we do it and, and what it is. And um, Basically, compost is the controlled comp decomposition of organic matter uh, by microorganisms in the soil. Uh, and compost is partially decomposed organic matter. There's a lot of confusion as to what's compost and what is humus. And humus is basically the result of compost. It's completely decomposed organic matter. And just to get an idea of what this is, think about going into a forest and you lift a layer of leaves that have been there for a while, and you see something that looks kind of soil and smells earthly, uh, kind of like what you see in the picture here, and that is humus, which is completely um, composted um, organic matter. So the only real difference between the two is that humus, between humus and compost, is that humus is made naturally over a period of time, and compost is man-made. Um, and then we, by managing the composting process, uh, can make biodegradation um, occur much faster than it would in, na in nature. So we're going to talk about how it works. Let me just move on here. So the soil is an ecosystem. It's made up of a, a food web. And composting requires an environment in which microorganisms will thrive. And to compost well, you must think like a microbe. 
um, and create the best environment for to support that microbial activity. Um, so basically, as you can see here, plants live in healthy soil, which of course is humus. And, uh, and then when we eat fruits and veggies, there are um, all kinds of organic matters left over. So we put those into our compost, worms and micro and macro organisms break down the food into nutrients that help the plants to grow. And then we start the cycle all over again. Now, the way it works, I know this looks like a pretty fancy picture here, but think about what happens when you exercise. When you exercise, your body gets warm and you feel hot, all right? And you start to sweat. And the compost procedure is very, very similar. At the beginning of the process, the raw materials are at a normal temperature, but as the macro and microorganisms kind of start feeding, they generate heat. And as they generate heat, it gets hot enough that only organisms that can live at these high temperatures are still uh, active. The others go dormant or die. So once the high heat organisms have used up all the food or energy sources, they start to go dormant and then the heat goes down again. So maximum decomposition occurs when compost temperatures range from about 43 to 65 degrees Celsius, kind of 109 to 149 Fahrenheit. And then at these temperatures, weed seeds and most disease causing uh, microbes and parasites die. And just a little bit of information, uh, at, it takes three days at 55 degrees Celsius to kill parasites and plant pathogens. And that's important to remember because as we go through the presentation, I'm sure people are gonna be asking questions about, well, can I compost this or should I put it in my green bin? And when you think about this, it will kind of start to make that make more sense. Um, now, when you have a compost pile, it's really important that you turn it frequently. And the reason for that is you want to ensure that all parts of the pile are exposed to these high temperatures. You may see steam when you turn your pile, and this is normal. A larger pile size will help to retain the heat. Um, and as the temperature exceeds that 60 degrees Celsius, the composting rate will drop rapidly and at hotter temperatures will become much slower. But then again, once you turn your pile, then it's going to pick up again. And we're going to get into how you do that and uh, why. So the basic recipe for composting. We need four things for the composting uh, process to manage it. First thing is going to be organic wastes. Your nutritious vegetable dinner, vegetable scraps, coffee grinds, tea bags, uh, fruit rinds, all of these things. And you need decomposers. So decomposers are your worms, your fungi, uh, bacteria, all of these things, microbes, mac uh, macro organisms. And then the last two things are air and water. And these things actually will start the composting process for you. Then what you want to be thinking about is how do I actually make the composting process occur? Well, whoop, let's try and run too far. You need his basic recipe is you have your greens and you have your browns and the browns are the carbon rich materials. Grass clippings. Um, these greens are very high in nitrogen. And this nitrogen is needed to make the enzymes used in decomposition. So think of it this way. The carbon or the browns are the food and the greens or the nitrogen are the vitamins. And you need to have a, an effective balance for this to work properly. So the way you should think about it is that you want five parts carbon or browns to one part nitrogen which is a green. So that would be, that's called the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Now, I'm gonna go into that a little bit further, how that works, but for now, I wanna just talk about what you can and can't compost. There's a lot of things that people think they can compost, but really you can't. Um, there are some organic wastes that are not recommended for small-scale composting. And you remember earlier I talked about um, 
things like uh, pathogens and the temperature required to kill some diseases and pathogens. This, in these kinds of um, situations, you want those uh, composting things to go to an actual waste facility. So um, the large waste facilities have the proper composting, uh, high heat, etc., to make these things work. So, for instance, diseased plants or leaves. You don't want to put those in your compost pile because they're probably going to turn up next year in your garden. Um, the compost pile will not get hot enough to destroy all eggs, larvae, or adult insects that might be harboring there. Uh, weeds. Some weeds will not decay during the home composting process. They could survive and spread, so it's best to put those in your brown bags. Um, treated wood. There are a lot of chemicals in treated or painted wood which is toxic. And if you are taking uh, this compost and you're putting it in your vegetable garden, that could have serious consequences. Um, dairy and animal products like cheese, meats, uh, bones or shells, these will attract pests like raccoons and skunks and they will actually be quite smelly. These types of things, organic waste, require high heat and are best put in your green bin. Pet waste. Well, a lot of people think they can compost pet waste. Same thing. They contain pathogens that could spread disease, cause odors, or attract flies. Um, now, there is a type of pet composter that I'm going to show you a little further in the presentation, but there are some caveats with that. Um, vacuum cleaner bags. A lot of people don't realize you can't put vacuum cleaner bags in uh, your compost. And the main reason for that is because not all of them are biodegradable. When you think about the um, amount of um, cleaners uh, that go into a synthetic or chemicals that go into a synthetic carpet, well, vacuum cleaners pick all that up and that's going to be spreading right on your vegetable garden. So it's best that you put these things as well into your, uh, your green bins. Um, grass clippings. Here's another one because technically, yes, you should be able to compost grass clippings. However, because they are so high in nitrogen, um, they will off gas a horrible smell and um, you could, they can also start a fire because it will get quite, quite hot because of the nitrogen. So grass clippings are actually best left on your lawn because your lawns, um, grass is very shallow rooted and you want to give it as much um, nutrients as possible and what's better than giving it more nitrogen which is basically what grass clippings are. So just leave them on your lawn. And then uh, compost bags. Somebody had asked about uh, composter bags which basically are bioplastic. Um, you can put these in your compost bin but be aware that they are going to take well over a year to break down you're better off to put those types of things in the commercial waste facility bin. Um, paper bags, however, will compost as long as they're unbleached and undyed um, and they're not chlorinated like bleached. Um, and that leads us to our next poll, which I'm just wondering if everybody realized what they can and can't put in their um, compost bins. So we have eggshells, dairy products, leaves, and grass clippings. And you can choose any one of those. How are we doing there, Supreme? Just, just a few more people. I think probably it's the internet or something that's giving them trouble. Oh, the poll is not coming up for a few people. Oh. Well, I'm sorry about that, Helen. Let me quickly try this. Oh, Lisa Maria can't see it either. Hmm. Are you using up on my screen? Yeah. 
It says it's showing as 100% answered. Oh, well, there you go. But you're not getting the answers up. Okay, Helen got it now. So probably it's there's some lag. I'm sorry about that, guys. <clears throat> Is your, are your answers coming up? Yes. Um, so there are a few more people that had trouble, so I'm just giving them a few more seconds. Lisa Maria, are you able to see it? Okay, she, it's not working for her, unfortunately. I'm so sorry about that. I don't know what's wrong. Okay. Alrighty then. Now look at that. Everybody got it right. <laughs> Nobody said dairy products. Good stuff. <laughs> Alrighty. Let's move on. So we're going to talk about the basic way to assemble a compost pile. It's really very simple. First, you're going to create your bottom layer, which is going to com be composed of twigs, small branches, um, and three to six inches thick of your know, brown materials. And the reason for the twigs and the small branches, this helps to aerate your pile at the bottom and will actually add to the, uh, the biodegradable um, process. Um, and it will also help to absorb excess moisture from the greens. Then you're going to put browns on top of that. These would be, say, leaves or cardboard, for instance. Um, and then you're going to put a layer of greens on top of that. And then you're going to alternate your layers, browns, greens, browns, greens. And um, by alternating layers, say three to six inches, it's not really an exact ratio. It's just whatever you're comfortable with. I usually go with three to six inches. Um, you'll have enough brown material to absorb excess moisture, but it will also help you to achieve an optimum carbon to um, nitrogen ratio. And then when you're starting the pile, layer it this way and leave it about a week. Um, and then mix it well by turning it. And if you don't have a lot of green materials, you can start with just one layer and keep building it up as you collect more materials. You can, extend, you can assemble a pile like this with no sidewalls, depending upon your local city uh, bylaws. Some cities, uh, for instance, I think Whitby probably has bylaws in place that want you to have a contained um, compost bin because you have to worry about things like rats and raccoons, that kind of thing. And then when you're finished, always finish with a layer of brown. This will help to control the smell and uh, also to absorb more moisture. Now, how do you know that you've got it, how you, you've got the right um, type of compost? You, you basically want to think of a wet sponge, a damp sponge. It's not soaking wet, it's wrung out, there's no more water coming out of it, but it feels damp. And that's basically what your compost should look like if you're putting in the right amount of moisture. You need to turn your pile frequently. Now you can do this in any number of ways. You can use a shovel. You can use a, uh, a turner, which is on the right-hand side of the picture here. I think it's, it would be your left, I think. Um, you can see he's using a turner. And on the very bottom of this uh, two-handle thing that he's using, you'll see something that looks like a butterfly hook. And as you put it down into the pile it's like this and then when you pull it up it does this and it pulls all the materials up and mixes them. Now it's not the end of the world if you forget to turn your pile. Um, your compost is going to uh, create itself faster if you turn it more frequently once every couple of days. Um, but if you don't get around to it you don't get around to it and that's okay too. It just takes longer to compost if that's the case. Now, if your compost is too wet, it will become smelly. So if you're smelling, you know, something that smells kind of off, then let your pile dry out. Don't add any water to it. Don't give it, you know, don't let the rain get at it and it will dry out. Um, now, 
oxygen is vital to the composting process. It's an aerobic process, meaning that the bacteria that are in there need the oxygen in order to live. And if the air supply is cut off, then anaerobic bacteria will take over, which causes the unpleasant odors that you sometimes get in your compost bin. So as long as you turn your pile regularly, this brings the outer, less decomposed materials into the center, which is much warmer, and this is where the soil organisms will do their work. Now, there's a number of different bins on the market. There's all kinds of ways to compost. Um, there are pros and cons to every single way. You can use the rolling composters. Um, you can see in the top corner here and then in the middle. Uh, the middle one is the rolling composter uh, sold at Lee Valley. I've had one of these. I'm not a big fan of them. I found that it got very heavy and very difficult to roll. Um, and I just find that if, you know, if you're an older person that is having some issues, um, back, whatever, then maybe this isn't the one for you. Um, there's beehive composters, which is this wooden one. And basically you just keep stacking the layers up as you put the layers of compost in. Um, and then of course the typical one that you're looking at in the far corner here is the one that you can usually get at most city facilities. And uh, I just did some checking today and was told that the city of Whitby uh, I should say the region of Durham will sell these black bins uh, to you for $30. They are available for pickup at the uh, Garrard Road uh, waste facility. Um, and then you can see on top of this black bin, this is a turner. You can actually see that little butterfly hook thing at the top there. And then the bottom picture, that's, this is called an open pile. And this is something you can do if you are living maybe a little bit more out in the country. Don't think you want to do this unless you've got a large yard uh, because it can attract pests, it can attract rats and raccoons. Um, so you want to be careful if you're going to do this. But the nice thing about having a bin like this is that if you just kind of keep piling your leaves and whatever in there, um, eventually everything will break down. It just takes longer because you're not turning it as quickly. Now, this is my favorite way of composting and if you have the room to do this I would suggest you do it. This is what I do and it's called three bin composting and basically what happens is you start in one and you start filling it up, filling it up and then when that is full you start on the second, the middle one and then as that one fills up then you move on to the third one and then by the time you've finished filling up the third one your first one should have ready-made compost in it. And you'll find this is very effective if you just kind of keep moving it. Um, and then down on the bottom here is just a different way of doing a three-bin compost in a, say, a more, um, you know, farm-like environment. Now, here we are, poll number three. And we're just wondering what kind of compost bin you're using. You can have a city-issued bin, you can have a homemade bin. You can have a rolling composter, an open pile, or maybe there's some people out there using worm bins. We haven't talked about those yet. Everyone able to see the polls this time? I can see the poll. Thank you. Okay, Lisa Marie can see it as well. She, she had trouble last time. Thank you, Lisa Maria. Okay, Helen, Helen can see it as well. Thank you, Helen. I'm going to share the results now. Well, a lot of people are using the city issued bin. And uh, nobody's using a worm bin. Oh boy. Well, I've got some people to convert tonight. <laughs> That's great, those answers. All right, we'll move on. So, tips to ensure success with your pile. Oop, just moved again. 
you want to make sure you turn the pile. And I know I've been talking on and on about this, but this is really important if you want to make your compost, uh, create compost quickly. And every few weeks or once a week, every time you add new material, just aerate the pile by turning it and expose the outer portions to the high heat in the center. It only takes a couple of seconds. Um, and then a three by three bin is usually the best size. Um, this helps to retain heat and also promotes good airflow. Something bigger might be a little bit more difficult, something smaller. This seems to be the best size for bins. Um, and then keep your layers of greens and brown thin. Uh, six to eight inches maybe for browns, three to five inches for greens, but it, it's no exact science. You know, the more you compost, the more you'll kind of get a feel for what's working for you. And then if you can, shred the waste into small pieces. This will make it compost more quickly. I know people that actually will have a blender and they actually put a lot of their vegetable bits and whatever in a blender to chop it up. Personally, I don't do that. I just don't have time for that kind of stuff, but your compost will create more quickly if you do that kind of thing. Um, and when you, you know your compost is done when it's dark and it's crumbly and it has a really nice earthy smell to it, earthy smell, I should say. And then the length of time it takes for your pile to create is like I said before, how often a pile is turned and how much it's been cared for. Um, and the kind of material that you use in your compost bin will affect how long the composting procedure takes. For example, wood chips can take up to a year or more to decompose in your pile. Um, and especially depending upon the type of wood, soft or hardwood. Now, I have heard this from so many people. I compost smells. What do I need to do to get rid of smelly compost? Well, the first thing, once again, aerate the pile by turning it. Because what's happening is all those uh, bacteria, they're not getting enough air. So if you turn the pile, they'll get the air, they'll start to consume, the smell will go away. Um, what happens is that hydrogen disulfide is released, and this is what causes the rotten egg smell that's associated with smelly compost. And this happens when the pile's a bit too wet um, and it's getting no airflow. So what you can do? Well, we talked about aerating it. You could add wood chips or other absorbent browns like shredded, shredded leaves, I should say, um, to increase the porosity of your pile. Um, you can or add things like shredded uh, paper, but make sure that it's not um, colored paper, just newspaper is good, um, as long as it doesn't have colored inks in it. Um, you know, the liquor store bags right now, they're great for stuff like that, but they should be shredded. Um, and these will really soak up the moisture. And then stop watering until the pile's balance is restored. So, down to our last poll here. How you treat a smelly compost pile. Do you stop watering? Do you add browns? Do you turn the pile or do you add more greens? I'm assuming everybody's seeing the poll now. Yeah. Yeah, we have more participation this time. Yeah. I'm going to share the results now. Great. That's terrific. Everybody got it right because you could do one or all of those things as we discussed. Oh, there we are. Okay, so we're going to talk about different types of composting. Something that's fairly new on the market is something called uh, food recycling. And what this does is it composts your, excuse me, your shredded wastes, including meats, fats, eggshells, you name it, um, at a much faster rate 
So the idea behind these is that you keep them in your garage or maybe in a closet. Some people can keep them on their kitchen counter and you just fill them up, they're sealed unit, and then you cover them and then you turn them on. And within a couple of hours, you have brand new compost that's completely dissolved. Now, I know these units run anywhere from about $300 to $500. They are fairly new. Um, I haven't tried one, but I hear that they, they work fairly well. Um, they don't have any odor and they're really fast and efficient. Um, worm compost bins. Now this is one of the simplest ways you can compost, especially if you don't have a lot of space, like you're in an apartment or a condo. Um, or, you know, in my case, I really don't like trudging through the snow in the middle of winter to get to my compost bin. So I go to the garage and I feed my worms. They make great house guests, they don't smell, and they never escape. And all you have to do is feed them. <laughs> um, there's no smell. They uh, create castings, worm castings, which are an excellent source of nutrients um, for plants and vegetables. They do require special types of worms, and I'm going to go into that in a minute. Um, you don't want to use uh, you don't want to use regular earth worms from the soil. Um, you basically want a mix of European night crawlers and red wigglers. Um, these are non-native, so you have to be very careful that they don't escape into the soil, and that's a whole new um, discussion we could have because there are a number of uh, invasive earthworms that are invading our forests and destroying the, the bottom of the forest floor, but we won't get into that right now. Um, now, Bokashi. Now, here's something you can do yourself. Uh, I know people that have actually created their own Bokashi units. Um, it's a Japanese term, Bokashi, meaning fermented organic matter. Um, and it's created by using an anaerobic fermentation process, which involves no oxygen, so there's no smell. Um, it can be used with all kitchen wastes, including dairy and meat. Um, it requires a special Bokashi additive, uh, which is basically, you can make it yourself, uh, a mixture of wheat bran, molasses, and water. Um, I don't know anyone who, who actually practices this uh, particular type of composting, but I hear it can be very, very effective. Um, and then we talked about this a little while ago, uh, a pet waste bin. Now, these are basically the kind of thing you bury them in the ground and you just put your pet waste in it. You make sure that you don't plant, you don't dig this anywhere near... Um, um, a vegetable garden or anywhere where you're going to be, you know, growing things that you're going to eat. Um, and, and you should be careful that it's not near other compost areas because if there is some sort of, um, you know, traveling, you don't want that ending up in the compost you use for, say, your vegetables. Um, it's ideally sited close to trees and ornamental uh, plants where they will benefit from what's going into the, the ground there. And uh, if you decide you're going to use biodegradable dog poop bags, um, they degrade in about three to six months in this system. And the thing is, eventually it does fill up, depending upon how many dogs you have and how much poop there is, and cats too. Um, so you would have to relocate it after a certain amount of time. So here we are. We're going to talk about um, vermicomposting, which is a fancy term for worm bins. Now, I noticed that, um, do we have any questions, uh, Supri? Should we stop for some questions at this point, or what do you think? Uh, yes, please, absolutely. Do we have, I'm do sorry. Have any questions? Sorry, can you hear me? I can hear you now, yeah. Sorry about that. So, yeah, if you have any questions, please do share it in the chat or the Q&A section. I actually had a question. So, uh, what what if we start composting and we do not have enough heat? Like, so how do we bring that about? Well, you you get the heat by basically adding greens and browns. And what happens is as, as you add those and as you turn the pile, they actually uh, naturally decompose because those uh, those little microbes in there start to eat and they create energy, which actually creates the heat. Okay, okay, okay. thank you. Okay, we have questions coming in. Uh, Dolly wants to know, where do you buy worms? Ah, <laughs> I've got a couple of sites um, at the end of this presentation. 
Uh, I know in the last year or two, uh, they've been difficult to get. Um, but I will answer your question. You'll see a couple of sites, uh, websites posted here at the end. Um, what I did, because when I moved, I gave my worms to somebody because I wasn't about to move them. And um, I looked for worms and I couldn't get them. I mean, because of COVID, for some reason, it's one of those things nobody could get. So I actually went on our local Facebook uh, site for our township and I said, does anyone out there have vermicomposting bins? I could really use some worms. <laughs> and sure enough, this fellow got in touch with me and I met him in a parking lot and we did the trade off of worms. <laughs> <laughs> and now I've got a worm bin going again. So. Amazing. We have a few more questions here. Um... Can you speak to using guinea pig waste in a compost bin uh, when we clean out the um, cage, like wood shavings and guinea pig poop? Um, I would suggest that you treat it like any other pet waste because you don't know what's in it. Like there are there are toxic um, microbe, not microbes, but th there is toxicity in cat litter and in dog poo and so I would say that you're probably going to find the same thing with guinea pig litter so I, I would put that in the city bin the city green bags uh, Suzanne sorry I missed your question there in the chat uh, thank you for placing it here uh, Suzanne asks why can't honey be composted um, honey oh, that's a good one I don't think there's a hard and fast rule on honey, except that it's very, very sweet. And I would think it would probably go in the category of things like ice cream containers and dairy. Because it's so sweet, it's, you know, sugar, it's starchy. And you might actually start to smell and uh, bring in pests. Okay. Thank you. I have another question. Um, so what about so do these worms attract like rodents or other kind of pests wherever no. you store it? Okay. No. no. So. That's good to know. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll move on. And if other questions come up, please do, you know, let me know. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about worm bins because obviously there's some interest there. Um, vermicomposting. This is the use of worms to convert vegetable waste into natural plant fertilizer. Uh, it's completely organic and natural, and it doesn't require any mixing, doesn't require any chemicals, um, and the nutrients and worm castings are very easily absorbed by the roots of plants. Um, and vermicompost um, earth castings can hold up to nine times their own weight in water, which actually make them great for uh, planters and, uh, you know, container plants, that kind of thing, uh, especially in times of drought. So how does it work? Well, basically, as the um, compost passes through the body of the worms, it becomes enriched with bacteria and microbes. And this helps to become, uh, this helps the plant to become more disease resistant and to repel plant, plant pests when um, it picks up the nutrients from the worm castings. Um, the presence of increased microbial activity can make this area more attractive to birds who help to remove the area of insect pests. Um, as the compost works on the plants and they become healthier, the need for pesticides is reduced, um, which helps the area to recover faster and start an improvement cycle that will continue and that is completely natural. Now, if you compare this to a typical cycle where chemical fertilizers are used, they might increase plant yields, but they do nothing for plant health or soil health for that matter. So continued use of chemical fertilizers leads to a breakdown in the soil. Ammonia and salts from chemical fertilizers build up and they attack the plants, making them less able to withstand disease. So among the hormones contained in worm castings are hormones, hormones that help plants to grow and improve crop, uh, crop yield. And so basically what you do, um, you can make your own worm bin or you can get one of these fancy ones like this, but you more or less just put worms and then you put um, shredded cardboard, some leaves, a little bit of dirt on top of that. And then you just keep adding um, food as they, uh, 
as they eat the food. And, you, and once they get working, because they keep reproducing, you will find that you can put, you know, I'll put in a, a big, say about that much food in one corner. And I'll go back about three, four days later and it's gone. Um, so it becomes very, very effective. And the type of worms that you're going to use are red wigglers and or European night crawlers. Um, the red wigglers are generally larger than the other ones, but a mix of both is ideal. Um, they're available at outlets, and as I said before, I'll, I'll show you a couple at the end of the presentation. Um, wormcomposting.ca and Kathy's uh, composters.com, but like I said, those will be on the presentation at the end. Um, so as far as feeding them, your recommendations, um, until your bin is established, and this is going to take a good month or more, um, don't feed them more than about once a week. Um, try not to feed them onions, garlic, citrus fruits, um, because they just don't seem to like them. They'll leave them. Um, and then other than that, same guidelines as regular composting. So you don't want to put meats and that kind of thing in there. They like uh, eggshells, they like coffee grounds, uh, basically everything except citrus fruits and uh, the regular things that you wouldn't put in there. Now, there's a couple of different types of worm bins. Um, you can do it yourself, which is basically the bottom picture here. And uh, there's all kinds of stuff on the internet about how to build your own worm bin. Uh, the only problem with building your own worm bin is I find it gets quite messy because you have to screen it out. At some point, the bin gets too full. And so you're there you are with rubber gloves trying to screen out all the worms from the worm castings and it's kind of messy. However, if you use something like um, the bin up here on the other side, the green bin here, which is what I use right now, um, I got that from Amazon. It wasn't that expensive and you can keep adding layers. So the nice thing about this is that the worms will keep growing up to the food. So the bottom, you can take the bottom piece out that's got your uh, worm castings and no worms left in it because they've all gone after the food up top. So you don't have to go through all that messy stuff with taking the, you know, the castings and the worms and separating, just kind of nice. Um, Sorry, Tracy, there's a question here. Um, uh, Lindsay would, wants to know, what do you use the tea for? Does it smell? Oh, well. Okay, there's been a lot of um, talk about compost tea. It does smell. Um, I personally don't use it. And there actually is no scientific evidence that states that uh, compost tea is actually beneficial to plants. There's lots of stuff on the internet saying that, you know, oh, use this tea, it's great, whatever. But uh, there's been no studies that have showed that it's more effective than just watering. So, um, but many people like to use the tea, so. Thank you. Okay, no other questions? Um, okay, so, whoop, missed something there. Um, so I just wanted to kind of sum up a little and talk about the benefits and the uses of compost. Uh, it improves soil condition and structure. It increases the soil's ability to hold water and nutrients, and it supports living soil organisms and helps to promote them. Uh, it helps to dissolve minerals um, and forms of nutrients. Uh, it buffers the soil from chemical imbalances. It helps to return organic materials to the soil and keeps it out of landfills and waterways. Um, and it can be used as a mulch. It can be used as a uh, fertilizer, it can be incorporated into potting mixes. You can use it in your vegetable garden. It makes great uh, vegetable garden mix. And it's completely natural and organic. So in conclusion, it's as much of an art as it is a science. And you've probably noticed that there's a fair amount of trial and error, but this is like in anything, you're trying to kind of get it right. Um, it's not a difficult thing to do. Sometimes when things don't work the way we expect them to work, it can be due to factors out of our control. You know, maybe it rains a lot for many days and uh, the pile was allowed to get too wet. Well, it will dry out eventually and your pile will restore itself. Um, but even in these situations, by observing your pile and troubleshooting, we can learn the art of composting. 
And if we have any questions, now um, I just wanted to refer to these references. I talked about wormcomposting.ca and Kathy's Composters. Um, when I looked for worms last year, both of these sites were out, but things may have changed by now. And then there's a great book that tells you everything you need to know about compost, uh, Composting for Canada by Suzanne Lewis, wonderful book. And then uh, down at the bottom here is a link that I pasted. Um, one of the, I, I asked Supri earlier today um, if there was a, a bin available through Whitby. And apparently if you go to this website, City of Durham, uh, you can make arrangements to get yourself a, a compost bin. Thank you so much, Lucy. This is amazing. Lisa Maria actually was the one who helped me out with that question. Lisa Maria, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a quick question. Sorry, I'm. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, how how would you? Is there anything different that you do uh, when you're composting in winter? Not really. Um, it the process will be a little slower um, because it's cold out and. Um, but you still will get a little bit of composting. It just won't be as fast. Um, you'll also find too that if your compost bin is in a sunny area, uh, then you'll probably get compost faster than if it's like in a shady area. So, and that would make a difference in winter too. Okay, perfect. And so in connection to what you just said, so in the summer, would you recommend it to be in a kind of a shady and a little bit of sunny area because does it get too smelly if it's like completely exposed to the sun? Um, not necessarily. It really depends on your comfort level with it. You don't want it, uh, if it does start to smell, you don't want it right beside your sitting area. Uh, however, you should put it somewhere where it's going to be easy for you to get to. Because otherwise you're going to find yourself, I don't feel like going out there, you know, because it's a super hot day or it's a super, you know, cold day. Um, so you'll find that you don't want to go out there. Um, so yeah, make it somewhere where it's out of sight, but convenient to you. Um, whether you put it in sun or shade, it really doesn't matter. Um, the anaerobic process will happen regardless. Um, and something else, a little tip I meant to mention was, uh, some people don't like it when they're collecting all this stuff on their counter or in their bin because it creates flies. And what I do is I actually have a little bin in my freezer. And that's where I put all my vegetable scraps. They all go in the freezer. And then when the bin gets full, I take it out to my compost uh, bins. And then that way you don't have the problem with the flies or any kind of a smell. That's actually a great tip. Because this summer, the flies have been like too much at home. So I yeah. used the apple cider vinegar to kind of like attract them. I was feeling bad about it, but I mean, I have a kid at home and <laughs> I didn't want him to fall sick. Yeah, for sure. We have some questions coming up here. Uh, hi, Judy. Nice to see you. <laughs> Judy is also one of our uh, Durham Master Gardeners and uh, Tracy's uh, colleague. Uh, so Judy has a question. Do vermicomposter need to be kept at a certain temperature? Um, it should be kept in a cool place. You don't want to put it outside. Um, and it shouldn't be out in the sun. So if you're going to put it outside for the summer, for instance, make sure it's in a very uh, cool, shady place. Um, uh, an unheated garage uh, against a, a heated wall, like a warm wall, is ideal. Uh, a basement is fine. Some people in apartments put them in closets. Uh, Lisa Maria has a question. Uh, any tips to keeping raccoons away from digging? Um, the thing with raccoons is that, you know, I know Whippy's got a real problem with raccoons. Um, what I would do um, is I would make sure that my compost bin was completely surrounded. Like I think a lot of cities, and I'm not sure about Whitby, have bylaws that state that your worm bin has to be on a, uh, a concrete pad of some sort or a patio slab, because that way they can't dig under it. Um, and should be secured. So if you're say using a, you know, a three bin pile, like we talked about, I would make sure it was completely covered with say chicken wire or something like that. Um, but they shouldn't be able to dig if it's completely enclosed. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay here has another question. Um, you mentioned that uh, wormy compost is in the garage. 
is your garage heated? No, it's not. Um, it's not, but I do have it against a warm wall. So it, it's against one of the walls where the, you know, we do have heat. So, and I actually don't have it. It's not right on the concrete floor. It's kind of raised up a bit because it has little legs. So I think as long as you do that, you should be fine. Thank you. Um, Jade has a question. Uh, if I decide I don't want my wormy composter anymore, how should I dispose of the worms? Oh, that's a really good question because a lot of people would just go and dump it. And because those worms are invasive, that's not a good idea. Um, I would advertise on, say, Marketplace and just say, does somebody want some composting worms? Um, you could also get in touch with um, either of the uh, worm composting or Kathy's composters, uh, see if they would be willing to take them, or you could burn them, uh, put them in a fire, just make sure that they don't get released into the wild. We don't have any like native species that would be of any help, unfortunately. No, unfortunately, we don't. Um, they just they don't they don't compost the way the red wigglers and the uh, European night crawlers do. Thank you for that. Okay, Ling Tu says thank you as well. Thank you. Any more questions? Think of any more questions, please do reach out to us. Uh, you can either reach out directly to Tracy via the information here or sustainability at whitby.ca and we can direct you to Tracy. Yeah, would... and on, on top of that, if I can just add, um, if you see, uh, you can see our email, info at durhammastergardeners.ca. We actually uh, take turns monitoring our emails. So you can always send questions about any, any gardening questions whatsoever, and someone will get back to you, uh, as well as our Facebook page. Um, if you post questions on Facebook, quite often we'll answer them there as well. We monitor that. So, And if you're interested in joining, please go to our website and um, get in touch with us and let us know that you're interested. <laughs>